so welcome everybody to the special talk today. And uh, we wanted to honor Sumati Rao after she received, uh, after she was elected a member, a fellow of the APS. And uh, so we requested her to give a talk, a review talk, and also highlighting her own work. And uh, today she's going to tell us about non-abelian anions in quantum colleges. And uh, oh, so over to you, Sumati. Uh, let me first begin by saying thanks, uh, Ayan, for inviting me to give this talk uh, in this uh, dual mystery channel. In fact, the very uh, uh, name of the uh, channel seems interesting with mystery in it. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah. So uh, I just wanted to say that since I'm probably giving it to a more general audience, I thought I'll give a reasonably long introduction to Mayuranas before I talk about parafermions. And then in the end, I'll give some, uh, uh, I'll kind of discuss the kind of work that we are doing in the last uh, year or so. Uh, okay, it's not changing. <coughs> Why the it is not moving? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, let me make it full screen. You can do command L, I think. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I'll start with an introduction to exchange statistics, braiding, non abelian anions, and why they are of relevance to topological quantum computation. And then uh, I'll discuss Majorana modes and in semiconductor wires. And in recent years, there's been a lot of controversy of whether they have been seen or not. Uh, there's been some work from Microsoft in the last year, which many people believe now that Majorana modes have been seen. But I just checked today that even that preprint has not yet been published. So perhaps there are still some doubts. Anyway, I mean, the next question is why uh, uh, paraformions, why, which is uh, the next uh, level of interest beyond um, uh, when even Majorana modes have not been seen. And I'll try to explain that they are theoretically interesting and kind of an extension of what Majorana modes are like, and they could have more universal gates. And uh, for our work, we have basically been looking at quantum hall systems and the platform in which we want to try and look for paraformions is in the quantum hall system. So I'll discuss the quantum hall systems and quantization of charge and heat transport in these uh, systems. And then discuss a slightly more uh, uh, topic which may not be familiar to all, which is edge reconstruction, because the kind of thing work that we have done also includes edge reconstruction. So then with that background, I'll try to talk about two of uh, two recent papers that we have. On, uh, one of them is on the fractional Josephson effect, where we I'm calling it spontaneous because we, instead of having a phase difference between the two superconductors, we will try to change the Josephson effect and control it by changing the lengths of the wires. And then I'll also talk about how edge reconstruction affects the Majorana and paraformian zero modes and affects their detection. So with this, let me go ahead to first an introduction. As all of you know, elementary particles always have to be either fermions or bosons. And uh, when identical particles are exchanged, you get a plus sign for bosons and minus sign for fermions. But for emergent particles or quasi-particles in condensed matter systems, this is not always needed. One could have complex phases under exchange. It is still true that if you look at the probability uh, of a particle of identical particles, you don't know whether particle one is at uh, position R1 or particle two is at position R1. So those probabilities have to be the same, but uh, the amplitudes can vary by a uh, phase. And uh, these anions, these uh, uh, particles which obey these kinds of statistics are called anions. They were introduced initially by Linus and Merham and later worked a lot on by Wilczek in as early as 1977, basically as simply normal toys. At that time, they were not really realized, but uh, 
and they became relevant only after the fractional quantum. It was realized that particles, uh, quasi particles, and the quant fractional quantum Hall effect turn out to be any on obey any on statistics. Recording in progress. What happened? Yeah, I I think somebody joined and uh, that I could say recording in progress or something like that. <laughs> Uh, anions uh, obey braid group statistics, which are different from just the permutation group, which tells you which particle is at position one or position two or position n. Because here, how one exchanges the particles is also important. If uh, if you exchange in a clockwise direction, you get one sign. If you exchange in an anti-clockwise sign, you get another sign. And as you can see from pictorially, it's very easy to see that even two exchanges will never bring you back to the same. I mean, there is some kind of a knot this cannot be easily unwound, unwound to get, get back just this. So anyone's obey breeds group statistics. And you can't just deal with symmetrized or anti-symmetrized wave functions. The entire history is important. So even a system of free anions is strongly correlated. The anions which acquire just a phase under exchange are called abelian anions. But uh, the kind of... Uh, no, quasi-particles I'll be talking about, they uh, transform as non-abelian representations of the braid group, which was introduced by Froelich in 1988. And since they transform uh, as psi A equals to U A B psi B, it's non-abelian since matrices don't commute. And the most interesting point over here is that they, they, you, to get non when you have non-abelian anions, you have a ground state degeneracy. So distinct uh, states of the particles to multiple distinct states of the particles can have the same configuration of identical particles. And the essential idea is that you can prepare the system in one ground state, exchange two of these uh, non-abelian quasi-particles, which is transformed by this unitary transformation to another state in the same ground state manifold. And the idea was uh, that these states are the qubits and the unitary transformations are the quantum gates that act on the qubits. So with this very uh, simple introduction to what are non-abelian anions, I'll talk about specific non-abelian anions. And the first one I'll talk about are Majorana modes, which are also called Z2 anions or Ising anions because they're the simplest first type of anions. So what are these Majoranas? And Majoranas were first introduced in particle physics as a possible uh, as a, a, a elementary particles, which can be their own antiparticles. And people initially thought that neutrinos could be like that. Now, of course, you know that that's not true, but still there are possible supersymmetric partners of photons or neutrinos, which can be Majorana fermions. But these are fermionic excitations. In the kind of models that I'll be talking about, the, uh, in condensed matter systems, these are not fermions. In fact, they behave as non-abelian anions. And in fact, the simplest, uh, uh, e easiest way to understand what these non-abelian anions, uh, Marianara modes are, are uh, uh, is in terms of a very simple model, which was introduced by Kitaev in 2001, where he thought of the fermions at a given site, he's thought of them as being made up of two Majorana modes. And uh, he wrote down a Hamiltonian for the system. And by essentially changing parameters in the Hamiltonian, he could uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, isolate the two modes at two different parts. The point is, the electrons can always be written in terms of uh, Majorana. Any fermion, you can always write, rewrite in terms of Majorana modes. Because a, a fermion can be, uh, the Hamiltonian for the system is was simply given in terms of uh, some kind of a chemical potential term, a hopping term, and what is called a pairing potential or a superconducting potential, because this doesn't have a, it's not that you create and destroy a particle, you, you have two destruction operators or two creation operators. And the idea is that any fermion operator can always be written in terms of two operators two, because this is a complex fermion. I can write it in terms of two real operators as Cx is half gamma x plus i gamma xb. 
And similarly, CX dagger is half gamma xA minus I gamma xB. And these are fermionic operators, so they uh, obey the fermionic uh, commutation rules, except that gamma is squared, there's now one. It's, uh, it's only the electron operators or the CX operators which can have uh, what you call uh, occupation. They can be either occupied or unoccupied, but the, not the gamma operators. Now, what you can show is that uh, uh, this uh, model, the Hamiltonian, can always be, uh, in fact, in two, there are two very simple limits where it can be uh, uh, very easily solved. One is when the, there is only one, the chemical potential term and all the other terms are uh, zero. Then uh, when I rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of the Majorana modes, what you find is that the, this Majorana, this Hamiltonian only couples the Majoranas at the same sites. X. And uh, when uh, in another limit, by changing parameters of the theory, you can go to another limit where mu is zero and t is equal to delta, in which case uh, uh, one can always, uh, you find that the, I guess I need to do something about this. I don't know. No, it's uh, everything is fine. Okay. You can see the, your cursor. Okay. What one can see is that uh, the this uh, Hamiltonian now couples uh, uh, the uh, Majorana modes at two different sites. So, so but uh, the, this Hamiltonian, what you find is completely independent of the uh, two Majorana operators at the two ends of the system. If the n, if it's you started with n sites. This only couples the Majoranas at n minus one of these sites, and the two n Majoranas are left uncoupled. So what this means but, is that the uh, Hamiltonian actually has no dependence on the n Majoranas. So it does not matter that if you think of making a fermion out of these two n Majoranas, whether that particular fermion is occupied or unoccupied. So the non-local fermion, whether it's occupied or not occupied, is not important, and the ground state hence is degenerate. It's doubly degenerate because that state can be occupied or not occupied. The Hamiltonian doesn't know about it. And so the ground state is doubly degenerate. And although this kind of very simple picture is only for when in particular parameter space, there's actually, there exists a range of parameters for the topological phase, not just the points where we have solved it. So you have a topological phase where uh, the ground state is doubly degenerate. So uh, but, uh, trick uh, was essentially to fractionalize the fermion and put different pieces of them at two ends of the chain so that they behave as independent quasi-particles. And no energy is required to occupy this non-local state. So these are these zero energy Majorana mo numbers. So the, the and what happens with these Majorana modes is that when Majorana, these Majoranas are exchanged, it leads to rotations in the ground state manifold. Here is the two, two-fold degenerate ground state manifold. And uh, if you have many Majoranas, if you have many fermions, it will be two to the n-fold degenerate ground state. And uh, Kitab's proposal was that this degenerate ground state or non uh, acts as a topological memory. And then transporting is Majoranas is something which is implemented by unitary rotations or gates. And since only the braiding properties of anions are important and not the local natures of the drop paths, and also because any kind of disorder will only affect things locally, you don't expect it to uh, affect things at a, at a non-local level. That is, if the two, I mean, you cannot change the occupation of the Majorana, a fermion constructed from the Majorana by any local disturbance, right? Because it, it, it is spatially kind of delocalized. So that is why uh, this, uh, this kind of thing is topologically protected from decoherence and noise. And it's supposed to be relevant for what is called topological quantum computation. So the earlier wisdom was that anions only existed in two spatial dimensions and are kind of ill-defined in one dimension. But now, of course, now the, this thing is that it can exist in any dimension as long as you can put enough constraints 
so that you know you, there is a proper meaning to saying that you can exchange particles. Even in higher dimensions, you can put constraints so that their paths are well defined. And in two, one dimension, you simply uh, can exchange part of, uh, Majoranas by using T junctions, allowing one, one Majorana to be moved aside and then moved to the other end by using a T junction. Uh, Majoranas and uh, so the, uh, the, this is a, a theoretical description of Majoranas, and, but, but, but where will you actually find them? The uh, by now we know that we, whenever we, we are trying to look to create these Majorana kind of excitations, one needs to it, since the Majorana does not conserve particle number, it uh, it's a combination of a CX and a CX dagger creation and an annihilation operator. So uh, a combination of an electron and a hole. So uh, at the very least, one thinks that you would need superconductivity, where you can where you do have. A, which does not conserve quantum uh, uh, particle number. But the usual S-wave superconductors have electrons and uh, with electrons and holes with both kinds of spins. Uh, and you know that to make an S-wave superconductor, you actually have to combine an electron with an up spin and an electron with a down spin. So, uh, but uh, for the kind of model that we talked about, which was the Kitai model, it, it was a spinless model. You needed to have a CX and CX plus one, both without any spins. So you need effectively spinless or P-wave superconductivity. And for that, what one uh, people realized that th that kind of a, 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 you can create that kind of a environment by ha having an S-wave superconductor and also having spin orbit coupling in the system. So if you have a semiconductor wires with spin orbit coupling and coupled to an S-wave superconductor and put it in a external magnetic field, you can create, you can kind of mimic the Kitayam model and have Majorana modes at the two end. Let me explain this a little bit better. Supposing I have two bands, one with upspin and one with downspin. If I just put a magnetic field, the upspin and the downspin bands will split. Here I've just uh, kind of uh, plotted energy of the band versus the momentum. Now, if I also allow spin orbit coupling in this picture, it will go to the picture on the uh, right. Because essentially what it will say is that the uh, spin uh, it will tilt the spins. The spin orbit coupling tilts the positive uh, momentum spin in one direction and the negative momentum spin in the other direction. So you essentially will go from here to a picture like this. Uh, the middle picture is one where you only have spin orbit coupling and no magnetic field. The, from here also, if you start with a picture like this, if you now put a magnetic field, you will go to the picture on the right. So this uh, right-hand model is essentially uh, has been engineered to mimic the Kitayam model because now if you uh, bring it close to a superconductor, uh, because there is some component of the spin which are opposite to each other, uh, the S-wave superconductor can also couple to this, uh, this kind of a band structure. So, because the, uh, even with an S-wave superconductor, you can essentially mimic the uh, idea of a, um, a Kitai model. And then that's the reason that in this kind of a model, you expect to have Majorana bound states at the two edges. Uh, so many experiments have to try to look for signals of the Majorana bound state. What they expect to see is that if they look for a current in something like this, if, uh, then at exactly at zero energy or at zero bias, they expect to see a peak. And so the zero bias peaks were something which have, people were looking for since 2012. And in fact, the first uh, paper which saw it was by Anindya Das and company from, this was in Israel, in Israel but Anindya Das is from IAC now. And uh, then there was a kind of a large number of other papers which also saw this uh, signals of this Vairana bound state. 
But unfortunately, all of these papers, uh, it was it's very easy to get the zero bias peaks. In the first peaks, did not even see full quantization. They did not the expected quantization of two e squared by over h. That is one electron at one end of the uh, sample and the other at the other end. It was supposed to give you an quantized conductance of two e squared by h, which was not seen in the early ones. But in 2018, that was also seen. But unfortunately, none of these things could be proved to be the Majorana because it did not uh, later more analysis of these experiments show that there were zero bias peaks, but they were not due to Majoranas. And um, there were many other kinds of experiments using anomalous Hall insulator superconductor structure, all of which were withdrawn in 2021. So earlier, when I gave the talk earlier, I was this is where I stopped saying that they, it looks like there is no um, mm, consensus on the quantized peaks. But uh, in two, last year, there was a paper by from the Microsoft team, which over 100 authors and 35 graduate students, where the title of the paper is Indium Arsenide Aluminium Hybrid Devices Passing the Topological Gap Protocol. And this paper has a combination of local, non-local transport measurements which implies a very high probability of have, having actually detected a topological phase hosting Majorana modes. Because they could also go, they could change parameters in the theory and go from the uh, 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 regime where there are no uh, 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 Majorana modes to the regime where there is, uh, you get Majorana modes. And they study, found this in roughly half of the 25 samples studied. And they, it, there was a paper by Payan and Das Sharma in 2020 that who gave us a list of uh, various cuts that have to be done in order to prove the existence of the Majorana. And at least half of these samples uh, satisfied all those cuts. So I think the general, I mean, at least a reasonable number of people believe that there is, the Majoranas have been seen. However, just today I was checking once again, the paper has not yet been published. So I don't know what the current, uh, this thing is. Perhaps there are still questions about it. I don't know. So this is where the field stands. But I, I would say that there's a strong probability that the Majoranas have now been seen. So. <clears throat> uh, Srimati, can I ask something? Yeah. Uh, so, what are this uh, criteria that you need to pass? I mean, um, in, is it involves only transport measurements and? Uh... It's uh, mainly transport measurements. One of the things that it has to pass is that it, they have to ident uh, simultaneously be able to see the Majoranas at both the ends of the wire. Oh, this was one of those criteria which was earlier not satisfied. So I right now, at least that has been satisfied that they can see the Majoranas at both the ends. They also have been able to see, uh, the, to tune tune the magnetic field and go from a regime where it is non-topological, where there is no Majorana, to a, the regime where it is they do have Majoranas. And then again, they are able to show the uh, uh, existence of the Majorana at both ends of the sample. I see. Isn't there some kind of tunneling that experiments we can do or can be done to see if uh, some uh, tunneling meaning? Uh, like people see this. Uh, like if you have a pair of marijuana, yeah, and you can see the tunneling of it uh, through some like people do in the context of Josephson effect. Yeah, Josephson effect and all this is. Yes. So uh, is... No, those haven't yet been seen. In fact, that's what I'll be talking about. That the, the other this thing to see Maharanas is to four pi effect, four pi Josephson effect, where you think of tunneling through two two through two superconductors. Ah, uh, okay, I see. So okay, that is that is not. I mean, the point is besides the non transport experiments, uh, the other kind of yeah, these are all the zero bias peak experiments. Besides that. Uh, to, the other way to see it would be to actually show braiding. Uh, and that I don't think any any anybody has shown till now. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> so
So then, uh, yeah, the next thing that uh, I want to introduce is this parafermions. You can ask why we want to study parafermions when uh, Majoranas have not been seen. Well, from the theoretical point of view, they're more exotic than Majoranas. And uh, it's the next, uh, it's like the same reason you would want to study higher modes, models and so on of Z2 and Z3 and so on. Uh, the other uh, practical motivation is that uh, the braiding of Majoranas cannot lead to universal quantum computation because it doesn't allow for all possible unitary of uh, operations, whereas the holy grail in this uh, field is universal topological quantum computation. But I should also mention that even parafermions will not give you a universal topological quantum computation. It will give you more gates and more unitary operations than Majoranas, but not all. So that's still a question mark. Parafermions were first introduced by Fenley in 2012. As generalizations, I mean, he, he was uh, of the Majorana modes, which he, uh, I also called, as I said, icing anions, because of the fact that if you start with the icing model, you can, okay, yeah, let me first, uh, I've written out the model in more generality, that you have a Hamiltonian, which has sigma uh, j dagger, sigma j plus one, and also the, the, with a j term and with a, H term, uh, there is a single uh, uh, operator. And uh, uh, the simplest way to think of this model is to, uh, if I just take n is equal to two, then um, capital N is equal to two, then this is just of the form all the sigma squared, sigma square to one, the tau square to one, and the sigma and tau have a, 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 a anti-commute. So this is exactly as if this is, I can take sigma j to be uh, sigma z and tau j to be sigma x. And then this will be exactly like the Ising model in a transverse magnetic field. So the one way of generalizing the Ising model in a transverse uh, magnetic field is to say that these operators now, the sigmas are no longer just uh, sigma squared being y equal to one, but in general, sigma j to the n equal to one. And that anti-commutation also has this factor two pi i over n. And then one can use it, the jordan Wigner transformation to rewrite this in terms of parafermion operators, just like uh, you could uh, rewrite the uh, Ising model in terms of the Majorana operators. And uh, if you do that, what you, it's a, this is, this is a non-local, the jordan Wigner transformation is a non-local transformation. And if you do that, what you find is that uh, the um, parafermionic operators uh, satisfy alpha j, alpha k is equal to alpha k, alpha j. And uh, with this kind of uh, uh, parameter uh, phase factor, which depends on the sign of k minus g. And uh, this is exactly how, if for n is equal to 2, this would be I, just the, again, these would be the commutation relations for the Majorana operators. And uh, you can rewrite the model in terms of this, uh, again, in terms of j and h, both of which are now quad have quadratic uh, operators. But even though, of course, it's quadratic, it is not solvable in general because of this very strange uh, commutation relation. The uh, alpha operators on different sides do not commute. They have this commutation relation. But the point is that although it is not solvable in general because of these complicated commutation relations, it is easy to solve in two limits. One where you just put this j is equal to zero. And then if I think of 2j minus one and 2j as as one possible site, then I, I'm just putting them in one boxes. So this is when j is zero and h is greater than zero. And in the other limit, it is exactly, you'll take, if I take 2j minus one and 2j to be one box, then in the other limit, what you will see is that it is coupling things across the boxes, just like it did for uh, uh, the, 
uh, my my rana case so uh, only thing is that now instead of being uh, fermions these things actually are spins so what you find is that the uh, it, it, this is like coupling spins on different sites and here it's like coupling spins on the same site and uh, ultimately uh, at a hand waving level you can see that this implies that you can get, get dangling for parafermion moids at the two ends and just like for the uh, Majorana case, if I now try to create a, a non-local spin from these two, then that non-local spin will be n-fold degenerate due to the possible eigenstates of the spin formed by the two n modes. And so of spin half, now we have, we have spin one, it'll have three states and so on. And uh, I put in this extra factors of phi and theta over here because it turns out that uh, uh, as long as, uh, long as f cos 3 phi is equal to j cos 3 theta, you find that an exact zero mode solution persists. I'm not really familiar with how they do this, but these, this is supposed to be related to things like integrability and so on. So uh, the parafermion zero mode persists as long as you have these kinds of uh, this uh, range of parameters. So from my point of view, the main point, because this is not the context in which I'll be using it, I'll look at it in the quantum world system. The main point is that parafermions are the generalizations of the Majorana modes. And uh, it's a uh, question is that uh, can they actually be engineered in any realistic uh, uh, system? And uh, what uh, we'll see that the most promising avenue is the fractional quantum hall system. So now uh, I'll give this last, uh, this thing of what I need to introduce, which is the quantum hall effect. And uh, this is again something which is probably familiar to everybody that uh, you have a hall bar and you have a electric field, which is, uh, or a current which is passed through the hall bar. And then it's the, you have a perpendicular magnetic field perpendicular to the surface of this system. And then you actually measure a whole voltage across the, uh, in the transverse direction. And this whole conductance is quantized in units of E squared over H on each plateau. And this is what is called the integer quantum Hall effect. And this integer quantum Hall effect corresponds to integer number of Landau levels being filled. Uh, <clears throat> the there is something called a bulk edge correspondence because uh, you have the edges of the quantum hall system and uh, uh, the if you look at how the energy levels of the quantum hall system look like then say something for something like say three fill landau levels you can see that there are three zero energy modes that will at, at the edge of the system, the energy levels bend, and then you can get one edge state per Landau level at each, each of the two edges. And these edge states turn out to be chiral because uh, they, if you look, look at the derivative of the energy with respect to momentum, and the momentum here for these uh, quantum hall systems is related to the y uh, position also to the what are called the guiding centers or the position of the particles as well. You can find that the, um, at, the two, at the top end and then the bottom end, the, uh, the uh, uh, electron moves in two opposite directions. You can also think of it as, as this uh, skip, skipping modes or something for a given sign of a magnetic field. Uh, the electrons can only move in one direction. That is the chirality of the system. So because of this, uh, uh, this is something you, uh, you might be familiar with for the integer quantum Hall effect. You're also probably familiar with the idea that for strong electron-electron interactions, one gets the fractional quantum Hall effect. I, I won't focus, I mean, I will be using the fractional quantum Hall effect, but I don't need to specify get into how electron-electron interactions are responsible for it and so on. But uh, here I only want to uh, 
focus on the fact that electron and electron interactions are also important for one other thing, which is something called edge reconstruction. And because even in the integer quantum Hall effect, it is needed to define the ordering of the Landau levels in the presence of spin. And if there's no Zeeman splitting, it's actually the uh, electron electron interactions, which tells you how to order the uh, Landau levels, where, where the spin up, spin down, and how the levels go. That is more due to the Coulomb interactions than to the Zeeman splitting. And it also causes something which is called edge reconstruction, which is changes in the number and the position of the edge states. Let me explain this a little better. What I want to say is that we've already seen that there are gapless edge states, one per Landau level, but uh, uh, there, it's only certain minimal properties of the edge, the Hall conductance that are determined by the bulk. Otherwise, the edge can actually be very different. It, you, know, you need not have three, you can have five, you can have anything. But there are certain kind of constraints that have to be, which are, uh, such as the Hall conductance and all, which uh, are topologically protected, other things are not. They can be affected by details such as the smoothness of the edge potential, electron-electron interaction. And this is the thing which is called edge reconstruction. Uh, sorry, uh, Sumati, I didn't quite follow. So, uh, so here I think the number of left minus number of right movers are protected, is it? No, no okay, let maybe I'll explain this uh, a little better. What I want to say is that the sum of the charge times the chirality is the Hall conductance of all measurement. We will be looking only at one edge, not at both edges, right? For oh. at a given edge, you can see that this is three e squared by h because there are three edge modes. Hmm. But I'll, I'll try to say how this can be reconstructed also, just in a moment. Uh, you uh, want to see how many edge modes? Even are... the number of the edge modes can change ah. because you can have counter propagating in the same side. And of course, this number itself is not topologically protected. Which one? And this number is not topologically protected. The, yeah, 3, three e squared by h is topologically protected. But if I have a counter propagating edge, if I, if I have three left moving and if I have four left moving and one right moving edge, that will still be okay. Yeah, that's what I said. So the number of left minus number of right. Number left. of right, exactly. You were that right. is what is protected. That is what is protected. The okay. usual that's index, right? Protected. That's the usual index kind of thing. Huh? It's the usual index. It's a kind of index. Which index, okay, yeah. yeah. That's the kind of index. It's also one more thing is protected. Uh, because if you have thermal hall conductance, Right for abelian quantum, the sum of chiralities of the mode is the thermal Hall conductance, and that is another quantized. That is the number of uh, uh, because here it is not charge that is important, but uh, you'll have to have a certain number. You can the charge can change, but the neutral you can also have neutral extra neutral modes. That will also if you have a neutral mode that will not carry charge conductance, but it can carry thermal conductance. So you mean the uh, so when you say some of the chiralities of the mode, you mean it's a it's a spin plus charge, or you mean the, the chirality of the. Uh, so what exactly you mean? Okay, uh, let me say what I'm. We in what I'm using, uh, what I'll be talking about. This doesn't come in, but I'm just trying to recollect for a moment. I mean the point I'm trying to say is that uh, you you. There's an overall charge conductance, which has to be this um, quantized Hall conductance has to be obeyed. And then if you measure the thermal conductance, then that only depends on the num uh, only on particle current and not on charge current. So some kind of reconstruction can happen where the charges of the carriers can change, but uh, the number of uh, uh, Okay, maybe an example where, where I'll be doing it will be easier. I mean, I can have two, uh, if I have one electron, uh, nu is equal to one, then it will be only one of elect, uh, something e, e squared by h should be there, right? But I can have, as you as I said, along with that two counter propagating modes, mm. that will not change anything. But I can also have this kind of reconstruction where this, uh, I can have two third electron plus one third electron, 
plus a neutral mode, which does not carry any current. Mm. That will also give you the same. Uh, both it will have to give you two quantities which are uh, always topologically protected. One is the conductance, the Hall conductance, and one is the thermal Hall conductance. Those two have to be protected. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I'll come to this maybe. In the example, when I'll come, it may be clearer. So I want to say that subject to these constraints, anything can happen, including spawning of new modes, changes in charges, chiralities of modes. Everything depends on details of interactions, disorder, and the smoothness of the confining potential. So yeah, I'm giving one example. As I, this is something you people already agreed to, that if I have a nu is equal to one, right? Then uh, if you make the electron uh, edge potential smoother like this, then what happens is that it becomes energetically favorable for uh, small, uh, the, there'll be one uh, mode moving this way, there'll be one mode in, meaning in one direction, there'll be another mode moving in an opposite direction, and this will be moving in the same direction. Instead of a single nu is equal to one, there's one plus a pair of counter propagating modes. That's what I want to say. I, and uh, you, one of the things that we worked on is something called the reconstruction of spin modes. If I have a nu is equal to three integer quantum Hall effect, then the three states which are filled are the zero up, zero down, and the one up, right? And for very sharp edges, the three modes are close to each other. But as the potential uh, is made smoother, they move far away from each other and they're far enough so that they can actually gain energy by having two like spins next to each other, even making up for the loss in energy and flipping the spins. In other words, okay, this, this is a, uh, what we can show is that what happens is that there are phases where uh, uh, as you make the edge potential smoother and in, for certain electron-electron interaction, it becomes energetically favorable for the two upspins to come close to one another because they, they gain in that exchange energy that way. And similarly, you can get another way of doing this is to exchange these two. Then again, the two upspins go come close to each other. So this is something we did in 2017. This is one kind of edge reconstruction. Here, the number of edge states, the spins, everything remains same. Only thing is that which the ordering of the edges changes. And uh, we'll come to more examples of how this edge reconstruction when I talk about this, this thing of how these quantum hall systems can be used to engineer Majorana modes and parafermions. So uh, the essential idea is that you have gapless edge modes and those are like chiral wires. And uh, you can gap them out by either time reversal breaking, that is by proximity. Uh, you bring a uh, uh, ferromagnet close to it and you think that then the ferromagnetic correlations are induced into the uh, wire or by breaking charge conservation, which is proximity with the superconductor. And exactly at the domain wall, by this, you can actually kind of mimic a Kitaya model and you can have Majorana modes if the if for the nu is equal to one edge states or parafermion words for nu is equal to one over m edge states for fractional quantum wall edges. And superconductivity is always needed because Majorana is an equal superposition of particle and whole states. Ferromagnetic is needed because if you don't have the ferromagnet, the whatever mode that you create will kind of leak into the gapless state. Since it's a gapless state, that means that uh, it, it, things will move out into it unless you gap it out. So yeah, with this, I'm we're going to be talking about our work with the, the, the collaborators I mentioned, Kishore Ayer, who uh, so, so was a visiting student with me from ISL uh, Trivandrum, and then he's now doing a PhD in France. Amulya Ratnakar and Abir are students of Saurindas, who is in Aizar, uh, Kolkata. And this is also with Kishore, Amulya, and Saurindas. 
so the essential idea is that we want to mimic something of this kind by in a quantum hall uh, system because in the quantum hall system i can get a new is equal to one as well as a new is equal to one by n that is i can also get parafoil neurons in these systems and just like uh, majorana's fractionalized fermions the parafermion modes actually fractionalize the fractional charge edge edges because the edge states over here carry quasi particles of uh, charge e over m which are run along the edges the edge states are now uh, one over m, as i said charged quasi particles and we now need to use bosonization to study this uh, system because they are no longer free particles they are, um, inter i mean for fractional quantum hall effect they interacting particles so they are strongly interacting with one another so the only way to study them is you can bosonize them and then write them in terms of free bosons in terms of right movers and left movers and one can use standard bosonization for chiral lettinger liquids the is, idea is that the uh, you have a uh, superconductive co correlations on these two ends and in the middle you put a ferromagnet or you don't even need to put a ferromagnet even just putting a mass term is enough because you already have a magnetic field which breaks time reversal invariance and so uh, what we do is that we, we realize that the superconductor couples left and right movers and the insulator allows for backscattering of uh, electrons so in that sense you have the terms which are needed in the kitayev model and uh, if, if this is in the fermionic language it, it this will give rise to appropriate cosines in the bosonic language which will pin the field appropriate field either the theta field or phi field for appropriate appropriate values of for large values of delta n we will take this to be very large and then you will get parafermion zero modes localized at these two points so you can actually compute and show that there are zero mode operators uh, i don't know if i should tell these details these are just the numbers these are the numbers the integers to which the field phi is pinned under the superconductor and this is the integer to which the theta is pinned under the insulator and uh, once i created this uh, found out the zero energy modes what you can show is that they act like parafermions since uh, you can show that it's alpha j to the 2m which is equal to 1 and they, they obey these kind of commutation relations for m is 1 these are precisely the mm, uh, majorana commutation relations and these are the, the generalized to parafermions so this is the kind of model that we have a superconductor and a, a, a insulator and superconductor and now i'm going to make this into a, a josephson junction by removing the m of x by removing the insulator between the two superconductors we can actually see that the, what we want to measure is the josephson effect and what we want to see is how the degeneracy of the zero modes affects the josephson current so i will do it both for the majorana zero modes as well as for parafermion zero modes but let me first start by saying for non topological superconductors for the general uh, i mean for what one studies in the standard condensed matter course if you have two superconductors then you know that uh, josephson current uh, is two pi periodic the hamiltonian is given like this and the current turns out to be the derivative of the hamiltonian and it is as if only cooper pairs can tunnel and because of that there is a two pi periodicity in the josephson current but if you have topological superconductors with majoranas essentially what happens is that you can think that their majorana modes are localized at these two ends and due to which now you can also have single electron tunneling between the two superconductors to do it more correctly one needs to write down the hamiltonian in terms of the majorana modes for for topological superconductors and then take the derivative to get the josephson current and what you find is that for a given parity that as as long as you don't allow the parity of the for a isolated system with a fixed parity 
then only one of the two subgroup states can uh, contribute and you always get a four pi periodicity in the Josephson effect. And uh, what happens if you want to do it for parafermions is that because you now have parafermions which are stuck at these two edges, which I'm, I, since I'm removing the insulator, these parafermions can hybridize. The same thing happened here. Since we removed the insulator, the uh, Maharanas can hybridize. So in the Josephson effect, you don't actually see the uh, Maharanas by themselves. You see their effect through the Josephson effect. And similarly, you will be seeing the effect of the paraformians through the Josephson effect. What you see is that now you can get something called a 12 pi Josephson effect. If e for three, that is in general, it's e by m. I've chosen m is equal to three. And what you find is that uh, you, uh, by doing the calculation, you can uh, check that uh, you you get a twelve pi periodicity in the Josephson current. That it can go something like this and comes back for a given for a fixed parity. It will go like this and come back like this, and then the others of a different parities. For each change of phase of two pi between the superconductors, the pinned value of one of the superconductors changes from zero to one to five, just like uh, in the earlier case. Of so, is this a prediction from your computation, or it's been observed experimentally? It's not been observed. These are okay. the, yeah. In fact, this is was shown earlier in fact by Clark, Kalisha, and Stengel that they you could get a twelve pi Josephson effect, and it has not been observed. Uh, these are, I mean, nothing for paraformians has been observed at all. And even for uh, for uh, Majoranas, the 4 pi Josephson effect has been predicted, but not actually observed, even rare. There's very, uh, yeah. And, Okay, now we in what we did was we also allowed the lengths of the two parts to be different, which you could do by allowing for different gates at the system. I mean, by allowing different gates, you can allow these two lengths to be different. And then what we found is that uh, even for Majoranas, we found that uh, along with the standard, uh, what people studied earlier. It is for E is equal to zero is the, uh, the total length is will not be important. And that's how you get the cos phi by two for the Majoranas to get the energy levels. But uh, what we found is that uh, if the two lengths of the wires were different uh, of the uh, system, which we can do in the quantum hall system because you the upper surface Upper half is a different uh, liquid, and the lower half is a different liquid. Right? They're, they're two different parts of the quantum hall system. Then, what, what you see is that uh, the uh, like I, what we can calculate is that the length difference actually adds up to the phase difference. So it acts exactly like the phase difference, except that now instead of the, this. Uh, even when the, there is no phase difference between these two, the, the phase difference between these two is not a tunable quantity between the superconductor one and the superconductor two. But now this length difference is something which is tunable by a gate voltage. So we can have some uh, kind of uh, uh, this uh, uh, handle to tune the Josephson current. So in doing this work, we also needed to do something, uh, learn something else, which is uh, about the finite size bosonization, uh, where uh, normally uh, you can always go from right-handed and left-handed uh, bosons to the phi and theta fields, and then apply Dirichlet or uh, Neumann boundary conditions at the boundary. But here, what happens is that the, you can't do that. The oscillator modes are governed by L1 plus L2, but the boundary conditions at L1 and L are set at L1 and L2. And you can't just naively go over to the phi and theta fields. You have to apply twisted boundary conditions, which all, even for the fermionic case and also for the bosonic case. 
and so the, the there was that was the technical interesting thing in this the thing and uh, we uh, but the results turn out to be very similar to what you would get when uh, just like you could uh, uh, you get the uh, 12 pi josephson effect for as a function of the phi now the only difference is that this can be now changed tuned by kf l1 minus l2 and uh, what we made was a crude estimate of this, um, how much this length difference should be. And we found that the order of magnitude should be tens of nanometer for graphene and uh, micron for sem semiconductors. So this was the first part of the work where we generalized what the Alicia and company and Linna and company had done to also include this length difference in the um, computing the Josephson current. And the second piece of work that we were trying to understand is what happens to all these Majorana modes and um, parafermions, which people st are now studying. These have not been seen experimentally, that they've been studied, but a lot of people have been studying it in the context of the quantum hall edges. So we wanted to see that whether edge reconstruction will change anything. And for that piece, first started with the new is equal to one integer quantum hall effect itself. And the essential idea is that we bring two integer quantum hall systems close to each other and again have superconductor, insulator, superconductor. And uh, the, uh, it, has, it was shown by Udit and uh, company in 2022 that uh, it is energetically favorable for a new is equal to one system uh, to, as you make the, if the, edge potential is uh, not very sharp, then it kind of branches off and new is equal to one third at the edge. Like the original one of the papers that I show, showed, Shamon and Ben, this was also shown recently by these people. And uh, uh, so what you have is that you have three edges to the system. As I said here, I mean, you have a new is equal to one edge, uh, you have a single charge E chiral edge, which is the single charge E chiral edge. And then you have two counter propagating one third chirals. But even this by itself, uh, people have been studying this kind of a system. What happens if in a new is equal to two thirds system and so on. So it's well known that if you have a one new is equal to one chiral edge and a, another new is equal to one third uh, chiral edge going in the opposite direction, uh, then uh, <clears throat> the renormalization hybridizes these two inner modes into a two-third chiral and one neutral mode. So this whole thing gets renormalized into one neutral chiral, one two-third chiral and a neutral mode. So in the end, you're only left with a two-third chiral, a one-third chiral and a neutral mode, which I've not plotted here because uh, the neutral mode is neither affected by the superconductor or the ferromagnet. But what we have as now at the top edge, I mean, this is a, the same thing that I've done, but now in the in kind of a uh, circular geometry. I mean, here we've written it, uh, this is on top and this is at bottom, but the same thing can be done in two concentric circles as well. And the reason for doing that is that the whole system is then finite and the counting of the states becomes much easier. Whereas if it's half infinite, if it has a, if it's undefined at the other edge, as it is here, then counting of states becomes difficult, but it's it's the same thing. I mean, here this, this ferromagnet and this ferromagnet are the same. So basically we, we had the, earlier the superconductor one, superconductor two and ferromagnet one. That's all we are really interested in. And uh, what we can see is that uh, the edge reconstruction now gives us for a new is equal to one bulk, you get uh, one two third edge, one one third edge. And from the bottom new is equal to one wealth, you get a two third edge and a one third edge going in the opposite directions. So what we wanted to see whether is this, will we still get the same four pi effect or what, or does it change and so on. And- uh, 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 can I ask something? Yeah. So what do you mean by this uh, renormalization, changing the two one-thirds into one two-third and one neutral? That is if you do an uh, uh, RG flow equation. And you go to the... Okay. Uh, 
Huh? So you, this is a more stable fixed point or something like this. Yeah, it's like a fixed this. point. The fixed point turns out to be where um, you 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 take this. Uh, you have one uh, one and a minus. Uh, you have a one going in one direction and a one third going in the opposite direction, and then you allow for uh, interactions between those two, and then you allow the uh, renormalization flow, write down the RG flow equation, beta functions. Then the, at the fixed point, what you find is that uh, this is the, uh, the fixed point will have something of the form two third and one third going in the same direction. The, the, the one go from one UV CFT to IR CFT. This is a, I see. What? This is like going from UV CFT to IR CFT. Exactly. Because exactly. Of yeah. In fact, yeah. The, yeah. There are experiments which try to look for the UV fixed point itself, but I mean, uh, the um, okay, I mean, the, the RG flow people will believe that this is the fixed point which will be relevant in these things. I see. Okay, again, this has not exactly been shown, I mean, experimentally. There is, I mean, there is evidence for edge reconstruction. Uh, but there is also, uh, I think, some amount of. Uh, it's very difficult to do these experiments, and most of these experiments have been done in uh, the Weizmann Institute, and they believe that this um, uh, this kind of renormalization does occur for the musical to two third case. But I'm I'm saying there is some this thing because there are also it there are, it probably depends on some other things because I think there is a uh, the, uh, there are. There is this person in Calcutta who's also trying to do those experiments, and he gets a different kind of a fixed point. Uh, not a different kind of a fixed point, he gets different results, rather. So it's not very clear that the, this fixed point works. But I think this is what is believed by most people, so I'm going to go with that. But this uh, in interactions are purely at the boundary, or is it also mediated purely by the boundary? Purely at the boundary. Purely at the boundary. It's uh, at the boundary. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I think the experiment in Calcutta, it's like some nu is equal to one. He gets something like three nu is equal to one thirds, if I remember right. But I'm not exactly sure. I'm not an expert in that. The theoretical work clearly shows that you can get uh, nu is equal to, uh, the, the RG flow gives you nu is equal to two thirds and one third. Okay, but um, all these all these physics you completely ignore the bulk. It's the same bulk. Uh, it's the same bulk. The new bulk is always new is equal to one. Well, the, you can think of it as a small bulk here, a small region here where there is a new is equal to one third, right? Because you mm -hmm. you've taken yeah. the uh, uh, edge potential to be gradual, going from new is one to new is zero. If the edge potential yeah. is narrow, then the uh, uh, Belief is that uh, you you will get multiple edge states. That's okay. the idea. That whenever the edge potential becomes uh, uh, no, not narrow, whenever the edge potential becomes smooth, you are likely to get uh, uh, multiple edge states, not a single edge state. Okay. Right? Thank. Thank. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now what I, we want to do is that what we found is that the ground state manifold holds four states which decouple into two independent sectors as opposed to the unreconstructed case whose ground state was twofold degenerate. As I said, unreconstructed, we thought that because of these two Majoranas, there'll be an electron. It's like, a, it's a doubly degenerate state. And you could have electron hopping, and that's what gave you the fourth pi periodicity. What we find here is that uh, even for the reconstructed case, uh, uh, the consistency, uh, the pinning of the minima now has to be consistent with the charges of the quasi particles on the reconstructed edge. And then what we found is that either one could have uh, e by three and two e by three. Uh, hopping, which is still a, like a single electron, 
or you could have uh, three a by three is hopping, which is also still like a single electron. That they seem to be two independent Majorana operators that we we can make make, but uh, uh, you still always get a four pi Josephson effect. It's always a single electron which is can be transported. We are not, I mean, consistency doesn't allow you to simply uh, uh, have a single E by three being transported and giving rise to a 12 by effect. Uh, this was not, uh, yeah. So what I'm saying is that the, the, for the reconstructed case, what we find is still a single electron is transported by a one third quasi-particle on phi one and two third quasi-particle on phi two or three one third quasi-particles on phi one. And surprisingly, consistency does not allow anything else. So we could not get uh, the many body spectrum continues to have four pi periodicity and not 12 pi or anything intermediate or anything like that. So even though there is edge reconstruction, the four pi periodicity of the Josephson effect is robust. And uh, so then we can wonder how can we even know that there has been reconstruction because and uh, we check that if the velocities of the two modes, the phi one and the phi two are different, if the velocities are the same, then we get back exactly what you would get for a single nu is equal to one. If the velocities are different, then we find that uh, for two different uh, parities, odd parity and even parity, the amplitudes change. It still remains, this is for one set of, uh, Firstly, we find that there is a, there are two sets of Majoranas which can be made. That is one thing that we find. And the, again, we're not exactly clear how we could experimentally say that. What we can see, we, we the only experimental signature that we could find was that if the velocities of the phi one and the phi two fiends were different, then at least the amplitudes of the uh, oscillations in the even parity and odd parity sector are different. That's the only difference, but it continues to be of the four pi variety. In each case, it turns out to be four pi periodic. So that is the main point that I wanted to get across, that we wanted to see whether the formation of Majorana modes in the um, quantum Hall system and the four pi Josephson effect was robust to edge reconstruction, and it seems to be robust. And this kind of uh, effect can also be easily extended to the um, case where we start with a one-third edge and Z6 parafermions. I mean, we can have edge reconstruction even for nu is equal to one-third. And in that case, also, we expect the same result to hold to with 12 pi Josephson effect robust to reconstruction. So with that, let me end by just saying that I hope I, uh, I gave an introduction to non-abelian anions as quasi-particles in condensed matter system and give a very brief idea of why they may be relevant in top quantum computation. I discussed Majorana modes and uh, also uh, gave some idea of whether these Majorana modes have been found or not. And then uh, I talked about parafermions. Right now, parafermions are not experimentally we are not very close to being looking uh, finding parafermions. Even Majorana modes have not been con confirmed, although many people believe that they have been seen. So, but I think in the long uh, run, these will be found, and it would be both theoretically and experimentally interesting uh, in a few more years. So. At least I hope I uh, convinced you that non-abelian anions are a hot topic. So thanks for listening to me. Uh, thanks, Sumati, for this uh, wonderful seminar. And uh, it was a good review and also it's nice to hear about your work. So we will have questions now. So please uh, ask questions, Sumati. Can I ask something? Yeah. Yeah. So it's... Uh... I know the experiments involving just fractional quantum Hall effect itself is very hard, but yeah. you know you have a lot of experimental predictions. What do you think is the time scale for <laughs> experiments to even come close to looking for it, or are people already looking for it? No, people are not. Uh, okay, uh, I I think parafermions. There's not been uh, uh, anyons. There are there are there are a lot of exper <coughs> experiments. Not just in Israel, also in uh, 
Uh, I mean, for me, this periodicity which you talked about is very intriguing and seems like, uh, you know, a smoking gun kind of thing. 12 time periodicity, yeah. That's yeah. not something I think we, uh, anybody is looking for uh, experimentally at the moment because I think uh, it is okay. Even Mayuranas in uh, 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 Quantum Hall is not very easy to see. I'll tell you what has been done. I mean, because it needs superconductivity and magnetic field at the same time, strong magnetic yeah. field. That itself oh. is a bit uh, yes. difficult to get. So right now, all, all I can say is that there are, has been some experiments where they have been able to put together uh, um, strong magnetic field and superconductivity. That's the. That's so what do they do? Lo the magnetic field is kind of localized and far away, in some sense, far from the. Um, superconductor <laughs> yeah i don't know actually i mean i okay i should think about it but i uh, yeah i know that my ma magnetic field and superconductivity people have managed to put together okay that is the only this thing so from there to go to where we, what the things that we are talking about is very far away right now my hope is still on first seeing that the myrona modes exist mm -hmm. And, yeah, okay, uh, fair enough. We fair also enough. have some like, predictions for on two dimensional um, uh, platforms for Myranas and so on. But uh, most of our, the things are actually kind of proposals. And uh, it's not, I mean, clear that anybody has uh, taken it seriously enough to uh, look for such things because these things are hard. And uh, I think, uh, as I said, I mean, there's even the quantum hall effect, fractional quantum hall effect, edge reconstruction has been seen. That is also not very easy to see. So that's maybe in graphene, some of these things will come up, but uh, I don't know. Uh, the time scale will be five to 10 years at least in graphene, perhaps, if, if it has to be done elsewhere in India and all that. Thank you. Thanks, Sumati. Uh, maybe more questions. Hi, Sumati. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi what there. is the uh, what is the tell telltale signature? What would be the telltale signature for these Mayurana modes in any okay. experiment? I'm completely. I don't know anything about this. What is the what experiment? Telltale signature for any in any experiment. What what exactly are the it's things a, that will tell you that this is this is really Majorana mode and not something else? A, yeah, the thing is that uh, what people are looking for is the zero bias peaks, and that is of course ambiguous in the sense that many things give you zero bias peaks, right? And uh, so you have to get, pass many cuts to get zero bias peaks. I think if you can show that there exists some kind of braiding. Uh, that uh, how will you show braiding? Yeah, you have to. Uh... Yeah, this is a this <laughs> is I can't give a good answer to because I don't think there is a very clear. I mean, ultimately, what you need to do is you have to. Uh, ground state degeneracy is another, another this thing. I don't see how you're going to be able to uh, say that you got a system with this kind of a degenerate ground state. Yeah, I have another night. Maybe you can have Sorry. collider. I mean, people are thinking about anion colliders now, but that's still abelian anion colliders. I have another naive question about. Uh... Anions, abelian anions uh, versus parafermions. What yeah. is, uh, are parafermions special cases of uh, abelian anions? No, they're, they're, they're non abelian anions. They basically. Uh, parafermions, are, but parafermions, you said they're just from Z2, they become Zn. That's yeah. abelian. But even, yeah, so even myronas are not abelian anions. Myronas are non abelian anions. No, no, I'm not asking about myronas. I'm just asking what is the difference between. Uh, are are parafermions special case of uh, 
abelian anions? No, or parafermions are a generalization of Majoranas. Majoranas are what I call Z2 anions. But anion, when you take one around the other, it picks up some arbitrary phase, right? Yeah, but it, it's, so, it's like a, it's a single component, right? Anions are like a single component for this thing. Uh, uh, Majorana mode is like a two component system, right? And uh, okay. paraformion is like a, a three component or a six. The paraformions I was talking about were six component actually, said six anions. I see. The, okay. For the new is equal to one third, the, uh, the anions which get, the paraformions which get trapped for the one third, any, uh, one third fractional quantum wall effect are Z6 anions. So they have six degenerate ground states. I see. So as you go around, as uh, one is taken around the another, it doesn't go back to the same state. It goes to one another uh, state in the same ground state manifold. Anions have a <coughs> single ground state manifold. Right? You I just take them around and they get phases. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so more questions? Okay, if not, then <laughs> let's thank Sumati again and I officially close the recording. Thank you, Sumati. Thanks, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks for thank you. giving me this chance. <laughs>